impact of uh, uh, environmental considerations on the use of the water, the uh, impact of population growth, uh, some assumptions on climatic conditions, and we have today a panel with very deep expertise from a lot of perspectives on the issue, starting with Kamyar Gavinci. Kamyar is manager of the State Integrated Water Plan for the Department of Water Resources. And then we have Tom Stokely on the other end. Tom is with the California Water Impact Network. He is a water policy manager and also director. But Jude Laspa, Jude's recently re re retired uh, deputy uh, chief operating officer of Bechtel Group and now serves as a member on the uh, California Institute of Science and Technology. And then Fernando Paluti, and Fernando is in charge of uh, uh, water planning and administration for the West Basin Water District in Southern California. So with that, uh, I'm Bob Cunningham. These gentlemen are policy people. I'm a nuts and bolts sort of guy. I'm a uh, uh, water chemistry and water treatment consultant, and our firm helps users like yourself uh, solve difficult problems when you're using this water that we all produce and hope we continue to produce. Uh, we get involved in uh, things to make your systems run better, to conserve energy, and to preserve your investment in your uh, physical infrastructure. So I'll sit down and I'll introduce uh, Kamyar for our first presentation. Thank you, Bob, and good afternoon, everyone. Again, my name is Kamyar Gavechi with the uh, Department of Water Resources. I've been asked to give you Water 101 in five minutes, so I'm going to get right to it, and uh, we can maybe talk more during the Q&A. So California's Mediterranean climate is in large part due to the fact that we get a wide variety of rainfall by as much as 200 inches per year in the northwest to less than five inches per year in the southeast. Uh, the run runoff from that rainfall, which also occurs variably over time, comes into our main river systems, the Sacramento River and the San Joaquin River and their tributaries, and that flows out through the San Francisco Bay uh, into the Pacific Ocean. Now, if you draw a, a transect from Lake Tahoe down to San Francisco, um, about 80% of our runoff occurs north of that transect and 20% south. However, the way water is used in California is just inverted. So about one-third of our water use occurs north of the transect and the remainder south of the transect. And because of that, over the last 150 years, we've developed a very intricate and elaborate water management system and flood system uh, at the local, state, and federal level. Uh, the pie chart, what I'd like to underscore is that about 75% of the water supply that goes to meet those uses is managed locally, both in surface water projects and groundwater. Uh, Colorado River water provides about 7%, and the state and federal water projects only provides about 16% of the water supply. However, the water conveyance system is an important part uh, of, of that state and federal project. Now, if you looked at the 10 hydrologic regions of California, which is a very large and diverse state, the white areas are the exporters, net exporters of water, and the shaded areas are those that import 30 to as much as 60% of the water. And you'll see the San Francisco Bay region uh, imports more than 60% of its water from other regions of the state. Now, the delta, as you probably are hearing in the news, is at the hub of our water management system in part naturally because the Sacramento River and the San Joaquin River and their tributaries drain out through the delta into San Francisco Bay. So about three quarters from the Sacramento River and 25% from the San Joaquin and the tributaries. Of that water that reaches the delta, about 8% gets used there, two thirds goes out to the Pacific Ocean, again on average, and then about 26% uh, gets moved through the state and federal water projects to the Bay Area and Southern California for agricultural and urban uses. Uh, this is what we call the butterfly chart in the water plan, and I did bring a couple of handouts in the back. Uh, these graphics are there 
for uh, closer inspection. The left side, the left wing of the butterfly are all the different uses for 1998 to 2005. The right wing shows the different sources of supply and the right edge of the right wing, the change in surface and groundwater storage, which is an important part of the way we manage water. Now, if you look at the regional level, then you'll really get an appreciation that the mix of uses and the mix of supplies are very different depending on where you are in California. And that's why regional water management is so important here in our state. We've been doing deficit spending with respect to groundwater. This is a groundwater elevation plot for a, a well in Fresno County from the mid-1940s to the present. During that time, the elevation of the water, the water table dropped 120 feet. That's often called groundwater overdraft. Here's another well in South Yuba County, and for the first part of that same time period until early 1980s, we saw a similar trend. However, then they implemented a uh, conjunctive water management program, that's when they manage their surface water and groundwater together, and they've now recovered the groundwater level to what it was in the mid-1940s. Because this is an energy summit, I thought it's important to um, emphasize that there is a strong nexus and a growing recognition between energy and water. Uh, this is an uh, uh, energy intensity plot for Inland Empire Utility District in Southern California, and it shows for their different sources of supply how much energy they use on kilowatt hours per acre foot. And you'll see it's very, uh, very diverse. And the highest energy uses are for uh, transporting water through the Colorado River Aqueduct and the State Water Project, great distances and over the Tehachapi's, also ocean desal. However, I will note that the Chino desalter, which is brackish groundwater, is, um, uh, uses less energy. We also, in the water plan, look at the future, and we've looked at three scenarios, current trends, slow and strategic growth, expansive growth. We looked at population, land use, uh, irrigated agriculture, water for the environment. Uh, we also consider um, climate change. Uh, our snowpack uh, is changing and the earlier snow melt. Uh, the runoff patterns in our rivers are becoming more flashy and sea level uh, is rising. And all those um, considerations, we looked at how much water demand might change by 2050. And for those three scenarios, the important point, the solid bars say, uh, we're not destined to ever increasing water demand. How we manage our uh, development, more infill versus uh, sprawl, has a great impact on how much demand we'd have. In fact, the slow and strategic growth scenario showed lower demand than we currently have. However, again, regionally, the, the way those three scenarios play out are very different depending on what kinds of uses and supplies they have. And, and you'll see that um, in the San Francisco Bay, again, for slow and strategic growth, uh, you could have a, basically the same level of water demand that you have now if development were to occur that way. Uh, moving forward, the, the water plan update that we're working on now, 2013, is, is talking about three important themes. One is we have to double down on integrated water management. We have to manage our water along with all the other resources, and we have to break down the silos between the many institutions that have historically governed water. We have to strengthen government alignment of our policies, regulations, uh, and incentive programs, and we have to invest in innovation and infrastructure. Uh, this is a very busy slide to note that there's a very um, robust toolbox of 30 resource management strategies described in the water plan that, that can be mixed and matched in different parts of the state. And if you're really interested in more information, we have the water plan e-news comes out every Wednesday, and you can sign up on the water plan website. Thank you. Next is Tom Stokely. Hi, I'm Tom Stokely with the California Water Impact Network. Um, we're a nonprofit organization that's statewide and we're dedicated to the environmentally sustainable use of water in California. The uh, question is, will the Silicon Valley run out of water? And the answer is that depends on the choices California makes. 
that busy slide that Camiar had, there's a lot of options there. And I'd like to address an element of that crisis, an element that is promoted as a solution, but in reality is an impairment to California's water supply future. It's called the Twin Tunnels, otherwise known as the Peripheral Tunnels. It used to be called the Peripheral Canal. The Twin Tunnels are part of the Bay Delta Conservation Plan, an initiative promoted by the Brown Administration to allegedly protect and restore the environmental resources of the Sacramento-San Joaquin Delta and to provide water supply reliability from Delta levee failure due to earthquakes and sea level rise. You can see on the map, we've got the blow up there of the two tunnels, essentially the idea is to take water uh, upstream of the delta where it's salty and tunnel it under the delta to the state pumps at the south delta. The concept is to uh, spend billions to restore delta fish and wildlife habitat and build these tunnels. The premise that it's based upon is that the environmental resources of the delta are failing and also that sea level rise and levee failure from earthquake risk will cause um, massive failure of these lever levees that will cause salt water intrusion and contaminate the pumps. Uh, unfortunately, it does neither. Uh, if implemented, uh, this project will actually assure the destruction of California's delta. There's no information to show that these so-called restoration projects will actually restore the fish and wildlife. What they really need is more fresh water. And it will also saddle California's ratepayers and taxpayers with up to $60 billion in debt and do nothing to enhance the state's water supplies. What it's really all about is getting a 50-year permit under the Endangered Species Act so that they can pump regardless of the impacts on uh, listed species. We do need to uh, actively and aggressively address California's water crisis, but we don't need to destroy the most productive estuary on the West Coast and hawk our children's future to do so. The first problem with the project is simply money. Here's a list of, this is from the BDCP itself. Uh, under current cost estimates, it'll be um, $60 billion, um, and that's if there are no cost overruns. These kind of projects regularly go over budget. Um, it's also predicated on bonds being passed by the California uh, voters, two different bonds, and also federal money to the tune of $7.7 .7 billion. Where will this money come from? The BDCP proponents have been vague to the point of coyness. The Twin Tunnels do nothing to alleviate the fact that the California aqueduct serving Southern California urban areas crosses the San Andreas Fault as well as other faults along the way. San Luis Reservoir, the major storage reservoir south of the Delta, the dam sits on an active earthquake fault. And in fact, a portion of that dam had failed and there has been no effort to rectify the current situation there. It's also been claimed that this project will not provide any additional water, but it will instead provide water supply reliability. There are other better alternatives to the tunnels. They include reinforcing delta levees, stormwater capture, recycling, and conservation, as well as brackish desalination. They'll create millions of acre feet of new, new water and create local jobs. Moreover, by de devoting sufficient flows to the delta and shoring up existing delta levees, we can begin the road to the estuary's recovery and providing uh, water supply reliability for our cities. And I'm just going to um, give you this last slide. This is the kind of technology uh, that is around. It's called plate pile slope stabilization. It's a way to uh, improve delta levees at a lower cost than current uh, estimates. The Delta Protection Commission estimates that the delta levees can be reinforced to withstand these risks for two to four billion dollars and yet the state has completely ignored it. The gentleman from Berkeley who developed this plate pile technology uh, approached the Department of Water Resources about it, and he was basically rejected offhand. So by investing billions of dollars in these twin tunnels, what we will see is money that goes into outdated uh, technology and not into the um, new alternative strategies that some of your companies are developing, uh, and also it would fund construction projects that would provide uh, local jobs for recycling, conservation, things like that. Uh, I look forward to a discussion of these issues. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. Okay, good afternoon. Uh, I'm Jude Laspa, and I'm a member of the California Council on Science and Technology. Uh, the council was founded over 20 years ago, chartered by the state, 
to provide advice to the executive and legislative branches on science and technology issues. It's made up largely of two-thirds academic, one-third business leaders, uh, heavily focused on the UC system, Stanford, Caltech, uh, and the national labs. Uh, they take on a lot of interesting projects that uh, uh, often go against the the core in Sacramento, because many people up there, first of all, don't understand science and technology, and there's so many things that are involved in science and technology that affect decisions, and many of the facts, when they come out to them, run counter to their intuition of what they'd like the facts to say. Uh, and so it's one of those things where Tom talks about something that's really difficult politically uh, in this state in terms of the twin tunnels, but a lot of the stuff we're talking about to them all the time uh, uh, really uh, uh, hits that. Uh, four years ago, we did a study of those things that were going to have the biggest impact on California's economic future. Uh, and one of the two was water. And we said we need to find a way to develop a sustainable uh, a water future for, for this state. And when we realize how complex that is because what we have to do is recognize that we're entering a period here whether you want to believe in global warming or not where we're going to have longer and deeper climatic cycles of, of drought and surplus and so what we need is a model that's going to span two or three or four years not just something that can get us through the one-off one-year time period. Uh, and so we started this process uh, a year ago through a combination of, of mechanisms, uh, uh, surveys, focus groups, uh, and following the threads of research activities going on today in universities, in the national labs, and increasingly in the private sector. Uh, and although we say Silicon Valley is the focus for uh, water issue here, Actually, there's an awful lot of water work done in startup companies in Silicon Valley today. And in fact, there's an awful lot of work being done uh, in larger companies, especially those that, uh, that are wa water intensive. Uh, what I'd like to conclude with uh, here, then we can cover s these things in more detail. We need to, we've come up with about six or seven areas where we're seeing significant opportunities to apply technology either new technology or technology that's underdeployed today that can be deployed uh, in, in a larger sense. And let me just highlight two of the ones up here. First of all, Kamyar talked about the, what's underway in terms of aquifer recharge. There's a lot of things that can be done in this area ranging from watershed management to active flood management, floodplain restoration that can help us get there and we have to just uh, uh, make the policy decisions that are on target to do that. Uh, the second area, uh, Fernando's going to talk about reuse in a minute, uh, but let me just hit the water treatment area. We're finding that there's more and more that's out there and these are at various stages of development. Uh, uh, some are, are still concept, but more and more of them uh, have moved into pilot plants and pre-commercialization uh, processes where these can significantly help us clean up the water quality issues that we're facing in this state. And that will end up helping us a great deal with the resiliency of the system. Fernando? Jude, thank you very much. are marching right along, aren't we? Oh. <laughs> Under pressure here. <laughs> we, we were told we only had three minutes. I mean, it's like... We have a lady over here with flashcards. <laughs> All righty. Thank you. I'm Fernando Paluti from West Basin Municipal Water District. You may ask why. Where is West Basin Municipal Water District and, and why am I here? Well, um, so West Basin is a water district in Southern California. I'll, I'll get to the map in a minute. But I was reading about Santa Clara Valley Water District, which is actually your water wholesaler here uh, for the Silicon Valley, and I saw striking similarities in, in both the approach to long-term water reliability, the types of water portfolio and management strategies that Cam Yard talked about. So imagine when I talk about West Basin and what we're doing, think about Santa Clara Valley Water District to help answer the question of will Silicon Valley run out of water. Is it this one right here? Right. Oops. Oh. Oh. 
We're off, we're off to a bad start here. Try the computer. Is that the one on top? The, the one on the lower right, the right of the computer. <laughs> That's I could I, do it on the computer. I figured I could. Okay. I could All right. Uh, thank you. <laughs> I, I think I've already taken three, three minutes already. Um, You're fine. So this is the, uh, what is called the Santa Monica Bay in Los Angeles County. So we um, serve, we're a wholesale water district that serves uh, 17 cities and unincorporated county areas uh, in south, uh, sort of coastal Los Angeles County. And uh, you know our mantra to uh, to the question, are we going to run out of water? Is is uh, is simply no. If you do enough redundant planning, and and, uh, um, and do the, employ the types of management strategies that that Cameo referred to, and so that is the policy of our board of directors and our agency as we move forward. This is actually looking forward to 2020. This is uh, what we call our our water supply portfolio, sort of like an investment portfolio, which you want to diversify, mit mitigate your risk by putting your eggs in several different baskets instead of one. Um, that one basket had been the um, initially groundwater in the area, but then the Metropolitan Water District of Southern California, bringing water down from Northern California, as Tom referred to, and then also from the Colorado River. And so we've taken up a strategy of diversification based on conservation, um, recycled water, which we'll get into, um, and reducing that, that, that wedge of imported water to a more manageable, um, sustainable level, and then exploring uh, the possibility of, of desalinated ocean water. We also have a brackish water desalter as well. So that's uh, the overview of our water supply and our uh, strategy of diversification. So um, I won't spend a lot of time on, on demand management, but that's not to imply that it's not important. It's actually the foundation of, of any good water supply portfolio is you start with your water use efficiency. And so this just represents a few of the things that, that we're doing now that the sort of the low-hanging fruit has been plucked in water conservation. We're looking at employing technology, getting into new sectors, industrial sectors, which shown here on top right is a, is a uh, smart irrigation controller. It's a weather-based irrigation controller. It senses weather conditions and it waters appropriately. Uh, Large-scale cooling towers, something that Bob's probably familiar with, uh, um, uh, helping uh, those industries um, cycle their water more often and use less water. Um, manufacturing shown at the bottom, and then a low tech but but huge opportunity in changing the sort of the cultural mindset of of Southern Californians about what uh, outdoor landscaping choices that they that they make, um, kind of going getting away from the old turf model into more climate appropriate, um, and that's sort of a long term change that will yield huge benefits. Though since uh, you can imagine about sixty to seventy percent of all residential water use, particularly in Southern California, is outdoor. So that, that's a huge sector to tap into. But then getting into the more we call high-tech uh, new water sources, this is a picture of our Edward C. Little water recycling facility in the city of El Segundo. That, uh, and what you see here in the foreground are, are the solar panels that uh, produce about 10% of the peak power for that plant. But, um, and I'll get into this in a minute, what we're world-renowned world for at West Basin is producing five different qualities of recycled water in one, at one plant. And those designer waters, as we call them, because they're customized <laughs> to, and tailored to the specific use, um, uh, the, the, the treatment process and the cost is, is tailored to the specific end, end user. And fortunately in Southern California, in our area, we have very large refinery, oil refinery customers, which is really the backbone of our system. Um, so, so starting at uh, number one, tertiary water, the lowest uh, quality of, this is, um, by the way, recycled wastewater. So this is LA City's wastewater that we divert, keep it from going into Santa Monica Bay, about 10 to 15% of it, bring it to our plant and produce um, uh, products, if you will, um, that replace precious drinking water for, for non-potable purposes. Um, number one is tertiary water, it's irrigation water, it's actually regulated by the health department, safe to drink, but it's not a, you're not allowed to drink it, so we use it for irrigation and light industrial purposes. Nitrified water is the tertiary water with the ammonia removed, that's good for cooling towers. Um, and then the three on the right are all um, more high-tech based. They're microfiltration and reverse osmosis, um, which is sort of the standard now in, in, in water treatment. And the three different ones are uh, what's called barrier water. It's really groundwater re replenishment. So this is indirect potable use of treated wastewater. It's going into the ground and then eventually pumped out and consumed. So indirect potable reuse. And we'll get, we'll get back to that in a minute. 
Um, it's the most complex process, microfiltration, reverse osmosis, ultraviolet radiation, and then advanced oxidation through uh, ultraviolet radiation. So this is very, very um, high tech in order to make sure that the water is safe to put back in the ground and ultimately consumed. And then we have the two on the bottom, which are industrial applications, also re uh, microfiltration and reverse osmosis. Single pass is for uh, low pressure boiler applications at refineries. For example, we have Chevron refinery right across the street from our treatment plant, and we also serve BP and an Exxon Mobil. All use this type of water for their low pressure boilers. It's all demin demineralization to the point where they can use it for boiler applications. And then double pass reverse osmosis, producing near distilled quality water um, for high pressure boilers. Uh, again, the refineries, I think only Chevron actually uses that quality of water. So you can see that that we tailor the product um, to the customer. Um, and then just to, to show you how things have evolved in, in this secondary effluent really means wastewater coming into our plant. Um, up until the 1990s, there were several steps uh, used prior to reverse osmosis to help uh, clean the water prior to, to that step. That's been replaced uh, since the early 1990s by microfiltration. And then the health department required us to put uh, UV or ultraviolet radiation after reverse osmosis beginning in 2000 when we started to increase the, the, the amount of recycled water we were putting into the ground. And then now in our most recent expansion, we know we're uh, looking at using um, ozone uh, prior to microfiltration in order to break down organics and keep our, our, our reverse osmosis membranes from being fouled. And then eventually that water goes into an environmental buffer, which is really the groundwater aquifer. So this is the model for, for indirect potable reuse of recycled water today. Um, and this is just to dwell a little bit on, on microfiltration and reverse osmosis. So microfiltration really is, it's a membrane process. You see on the bottom right, it's actually about 2,000 of these tiny plastic straws bundled together into a cartridge. And you can see on the bottom right, that's what one single strand looks like. That plastic straw has tiny holes, one three hundredth the size of a human hair on, on the surface of it. And so, and that surface is represented by that cartoon where water is put under pressure, it's about 20 PSI, forced through the tiny pores in the surface of the straw, and the cleaner water, the permeate, goes out the end of the straw. And then it goes to reverse osmosis, again a, mem a membrane process, but this is more like you can imagine a jelly roll or a or your kitchen paper towels, how they're wrapped around a center. That is, uh, there's a plastic perforated tube in the middle with uh, a, a plastic sheet, if you will, a membrane, a permeable membrane wrapped around it. Water is, is forced under pressure th through, um, spiraling through the membrane, and then the, the clean water goes out the end of, uh, the, end of the pipe. Those, micro, those uh, reverse osmosis uh, membranes are housed within the uh, white, uh, ceramic tubes, those are bundled into arrays, and water is then sent through that, that process represented by the cartoon again. Your feed flow coming from microfiltration, water getting forced through um, the, the membrane. This captures now the, the, the smaller organics, um, salts and minerals, so that your, your permeate is a, is a very, very pure um, water, purer than, than, most, than most tap water. Um, not to dwell on, on uh, ocean water desalination, but it's the same process. The only difference is that the source water you're using is seawater, much, much more highly saline than wastewater, so it requires more pressure to force it through the membrane. That more pressure requires more energy and more cost, which is the, the, you know, the, the most uh, common criticism of, uh, of ocean desalination. So we're looking in that. This is our, our um, pilot uh, facility in the city of Redondo Beach, producing about 20,000 gallons a day for demonstration purposes. It also allows us to test intake and discharge technologies because the other um, challenge with ocean desalination is being protective of marine life. Um, so we are looking at that and just to show you an example, these are the four E's that we concentrate on. The most uh, passionate one uh, is, that we feel about is environment and so we're testing um, a intake technology that features a screen that reduces velocities for the intake so that sea life doesn't get impinged onto the screen or is or entrained and uh, put into the pumps. This helps uh, then to reduce mortality of sea life um, uh, uh, dramatically and so we're testing that as well. So I wanted to conclude with looking forward to the future. Um, this is the cycle of treatment that I talked about for indirect potable reuse. This is what we do today at our, at our treatment plant. Um, wastewater treatment 
gets put through advanced water treatment, which is reverse osmosis plus ultraviolet radiation, but then it goes to a natural barrier system. This is the, the, the groundwater aquifer. It gets further treatment in the soil matrix for about 20 years before it's pumped out, sometimes sent to another water treatment plant on top of that, and then back to, to, uh, to the urban water use again, completing the cycle. Um, what something called direct potable reuse proposes to do in the future is really to eliminate the steps of the natural treatment system and further water treatment. So then now you're looking at sort of short-circuiting that and going back into, into the distribution system. So really the challenge here is to um, produce a engineered buffer that replaces the natural buffer um, and to increase public confidence in this process. So I think a lot of research is still to be done, but, uh, and I was just talking to, uh, to Bob about this, there, there's a, um, a very concerted effort underway to raise money for research to identify what are the remaining um, research areas in the social sciences and technology operations that need to be addressed so that someday this becomes a reality. Um, and um, part of, of the, of the um, process is to obviously have this, um, the regulations in place by the Department of Health Services to allow this to happen. That doesn't exist today, but through legislation, um, they have established a deadline for convening expert panels to identify the research needs and actually write those regulations in the next few years so that, and I'm not predicting when, 10, 20 uh, years down the line, I think we may be able to see you know, this type of, of um, sustainable uh, use of our um, uh, completing this, you know, the, the wastewater treatment cycle and, and having this be a, a huge um, uh, potential water uh, source in the future. Just keep in mind that uh, along the California coast, there's um, three billion gallons a day of, of wastewater effluent to the ocean. We only recycle about 650,000 acre feet today in, in California, I think, come here, check my, check my numbers. And we have a goal of, I think, over a million acre feet, and I'm not sure, sure when that, that goal is for the state of California. We're never gonna get there by doing what we're doing at West Basin, for example, which is treating water, send it to refineries through purple pipe. There's just not enough, um, and it, it's cost prohibited to do that on a large scale. But to imagine um, this, where we can take that huge potential of wastewater effluent going to the ocean, reuse that, um, you know, then we're going to see, uh, we're going to make those goals and then some uh, in California. So that's an exciting opportunity. Uh, the obligatory quote, uh, this one by the, the British poet Auden. And uh, thank you very much. Fernando, thank you. I have a quick question for Fernando. Where does the water come from for the astronauts? It comes through uh, a process similar to uh, reverse osmosis. Right? So the process is there. The research work needed is just further development so that we can magnify the scale of that and produce great volumes of water rather than small volumes of water, right? And have the public confidence in it, yes. Yeah, that's the big so without issue. Without that, you're, you're going to get nowhere. And we've been set back several times because of the, the toilet to tap mentality, so. The uh, Water Factory 21 in Orange County, uh, that's essentially taking wastewater, cleaning it up, injecting it in barrier wells. Right behind the barrier wells are drinking water wells. So they've been drinking that water filtered through the sand for approximately 26 years, 27 years. So all we're talking about doing is replacing the filtration element rather than the sand and soil. It's going to be some sort of an artificial medium. That's correct. Questions from the audience? Is that better than I did? <laughs> <laughs> Jim? <clears throat> um, are there really any uh, barriers other than dollar barriers to that direct uh, uh, potable water we use. Uh, you go to Singapore and almost every drop of that water is uh, cleaned up. It goes either dumped into the reservoirs so it gets some flavor or it goes to industrial use. So they sell it under the name of new water and I got a few bottles at home I can tell you. It's not very, 
It's not great to drink because they take everything out of it. It's so tasteless that you got to put some junk back in it to make it worth drinking. But <laughs> is, there, is, is, it, is the only barrier here simply cost or, uh, or is there really uh, something that is either sociological or, or technological that stops us doing what Singapore does? I, th I think the short answer to that, and I'll, and I'll yeah. defer to the panelists, is, is sociological. I, I don't believe it is a cost issue. Well, <clears throat> from the state's perspective, um, it's, there's also a public health concern. So the Department of Public Health, as Fernando mentioned, is coming up with new guidelines for indirect potable reuse, for putting recycled water in the ground, but also into surface reservoirs. I know San Diego and others are very interested in taking treated wastewater and putting it into a surface reservoir that would allow for that natural uh, barrier before it was used. Um, Department of Public Health was also directed under the same legislation to begin looking at the issues that would need to be dealt with for direct potable reuse. And um, right now, in particular, there's a lot of concern about emerging contaminants, uh, endocrine disruptors, hormones, and other things that get into our uh, human water, wastewater. And so the part of that building that public confidence will be to have uh, reassurance from a scientific point of view that there wouldn't be a public health uh, concern if after the um, uh, reverse osmosis, the water was put directly back into the uh, water distribution system. Economically, it, that makes a lot of sense because right now to use uh, the wastewater, excuse me, the recycle water directly, it has to go into purple pipe system. And that uh, adds a lot of cost to uh, buildings and, um, and that additional infrastructure. Yes, sir. Uh, our microphone is where? There we are. Yes, sir. You have the mic? Yeah, I've got the mic. Uh, hi, I'm Don Wood, uh, Draper Fisher Jurvetson. We're venture investors. Um, I've got a question about water conservation. Um, what are the incentives of the water uh, municipal water districts to to conserve water? Since your revenue comes from selling water, and we've had you know 50 years of electric utilities acting like they care about conservation, but not really doing much about it. So how is it different with water? And um, and then also as a side question, how important is residential water consumption in the big picture? Well, that's a, that's a very good point, and uh, that's something that we grapple with and, and, frankly, don't do a very good job of explaining to the public, you know, why their water rates continue to go up when, when they are conserving water, and that's simply because we, we work in a very capital-intensive business, um, huge fixed costs, and, and uh, when you sell less water, you make less revenue, but you still have those huge fixed costs, which are tied up in your infrastructure. So. So we need to do a better job of explaining that uh, to people. Um, what is our motivation? Well, um, uh, we simply uh, can't do without it. I mean, we, we could never justify the advancements that we're making in, in, in recycled water and ocean desalination without first um, doing everything that we can within reason. I mean, you can always um, throw more money at it, but, but water use efficiency really is the backbone of, of, of uh, you know, of, of what we do. So it's, it is the right thing to do, and um, so there really is, that, there's really no way around it. I mean, that, that's something that we, we must do. But then we, we need to make sure we look at the pieces about where the efficiency is, because ag, agriculture in California consumes a tremendous amount of, of water, uh, and the, the person who's paying for it there is the, is the grower. Uh, and the grower has a lot of levers that they can pull uh, between uh, optimizing the amount of water it takes per unit of output uh, of, of product that they have to the selection of the products they, that, that they have because there are many things that are grown which are high value crops in California uh, which are much lower water intensity uh, than, than others. Uh, there's some that uh, still require flood irrigation and you could still argue that rice 
is, is a good crop in California because of the environmental and the wetlands restoration issues. So it's a very complex thing, but you have to sort of get it back to where the consumer is uh, on this and, and have them be part of that process as opposed to trying to drive it through some kind of regulatory regime uh, that uh, uh, really will fly in the face of what market forces uh, can be incented to do. Part of it depends on where you live. Um, in the big picture, statewide, if we have about 80 million acre feet on average of water use, about 10 of that, nine and a half to 10, is for what we call uh, urban water use, which is residential, institutional, and industrial. Uh, of the residential uh, water use, as Fernando mentioned, um, as much as uh, 60 to 70% even higher in the desert southeast of the residential water use is outdoor water use. So in California, we have been very um, successful in uh, reducing our indoor water use over the last 10, 15 years. Uh, w the next big opportunity is the landscape uh, water use. Uh, now, how much of that 10 is residential and how much is industrial? Yeah. Uh, Actually, maybe about seven and a half to eight is residential. Mm -hmm. So industrial and institutional is not a big part of that. I wanted to point out one thing about the Twin Tunnels project in that it would be tens of billions of dollars that will be billed to these urban water agencies with no additional water. So you're going to basically have bills go up without more water to sell. As um, Fernando pointed out, that's already an issue for the districts, um, and that's one of our big arguments against it is why would Southern California or the Silicon Valley spend billions of dollars not to get any more water when, in fact, they could spend billions of dollars to recycle that waste stream that's going out into the ocean? The, the, just one other point. As I, you know, as part of the California Water Plan, I get an opportunity to talk with folks throughout California, and one thing that is... Uh, reinforced everywhere we go is conservation is one of the most cost-effective strategies available to water agencies throughout California. So while on the one hand you're right by reducing the water delivery it is affecting their revenue stream and there are uh, uh, work that's being done now to come up with more innovative rate structures <laughs> that can provide the funds for the fixed cost of the delivering the water and still provide a variable uh, rate that can incent conservation. Uh, but it makes good business sense for agencies to invest in conservation because the next strategy available to them would be more costly. I think the provision of water is one of the largest energy users in the state. Mm -hmm. What is the industry or the different districts doing to uh, support the use of renewables and other alternative sources of energy to support that. So we want to take that? Yeah, well, that, that's one thing on the screen. Uh, we have, uh, we're employing solar panels. Um, but you're right, I, I, and I, the, the figures vary. Um, I've heard the, the 15, 20% uh, of all energy used in California is, uh, is related to the um, procurement, the distribution uh, of, of water. Um, so, so it is, it is a huge, it is a huge issue. Um, uh, I don't have, didn't have enough time to talk about it, but this whole uh, water energy uh, nexus is, is, a, is a very interesting and promising opportunity. Um, but, uh, and the gentleman, uh, you sort of insinuated about the, 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 the power companies, you know, getting the uh, energy sector to buy into the fact that um, there's this concept of embedded energy in in water uh, delivery, particularly in Southern California, when you have to pump water over the Tehachapi Mountains into Southern California. It's a it's a huge. In fact, I think it's the single Same greatest use of energy in yeah. the, in the state. Yeah. Um, and getting them to understand and agree to um, what the um, 
what is the uh, investment they can make in water conservation so that by saving you know, a gallon of water, you save a certain amount of energy, and vice versa. And that, right. that nexus is, be, is becoming uh, more and more evident, uh, and hopefully will uh, you know, we'll continue to, to drive uh, uh, investments across those two industries. I'm not sure if that answered your question. Adrian, can we have the mic down here? This gentleman's been very patient with his hand up. The, the one thing I'll add on to that is a big a part of the opportunity for energy saving is end user. Uh, appliances. So a lot of the energy that's uh, dissipated is because of uh, uh, water that's not used efficiently at the tap, or we heat water and then we use it and it goes, you know, the energy to heat it as well as the water uh, energy used to get the water there goes, goes out the drain. I wonder if one of you could talk a little bit about how um, water prices are set compared to how electricity prices are set. I'm familiar with the, the arduous regulatory uh, process that the PUC uses to allow energy, electricity prices to go up, um, not at all understanding how the city of Mountain View, where I live, decides how to, how to set water prices. They both have a three-tier ascending block kind of pricing structure where on the margin, a homeowner who uses a lot of water pays four times as much per gallon as someone who's a frugal user in an apartment. Um, it seems to me that there might be more transparency about this, or maybe I'm just unaware of the opportunities people have to have input to the process. Hmm. Well, that's a very good question and a very complicated answer, um, uh, particularly when you uh, consider that uh, um, th there, uh, Rate setting is a highly political process. Um, our, our rate setting at West Basin is, is, is fairly simple. We're a wholesaler. We have retail customers. Um, when it comes to the sale of, of, of potable water, um, we, we don't have an inclining block structure. We have to have a declining block structure for recycled water because we want to encourage its use. But at my understanding at, at, the, at the retail level, um, there are, uh, uh, as, as a way to help conserve um, we're, we're seeing greater and greater adoption of these inclining block structures. Um, they can create inequities. Um, uh, and then I just wanted to, again, reinforce the fact that, um, and, and this is something that, that we deal with all the time, um, rate setting at, at, the, at the local level, at the municipal level, is, is a highly political process. That, and, um, and, and so you see these uh, periods where, where rates are not raised um, to keep up with investments in infrastructure, replacement of infrastructure, which is becoming a, a very, very large issue. Um, and then you have private water companies that serve about one uh, out, of, out of every five yep. uh, Californians, uh, and that is the PUC process um, on the water side that is regulated by the California Public Utilities Commission. And they actually get a rate of return uh, when they do invest in infrastructure. And so they have a, they have a, a very different rate setting structure. So what I guess what I'm pointing to is that, that there really is no um, consistency uh, and that in itself uh, causes a great amount of frustration um, amongst water users all around the state. What I could add to that is the California Urban Water Conservation Council mm -hmm. just uh, this last week held two workshops, one in Sacramento, one in Southern Cal, on water rate structures because it is recognized as being a big deal. And I think the, the goal is to have consistency of approach and principles, but recognize that each uh, agency, water agency, be, depending on where they are and what their water supply mix is, um, has to approach rates setting differently. So you can't have a cookie cutter approach because their infrastructure is different, their fixed rate uh, uh, proportion is different. And I totally agree with you that a lot of the frustration on the customers is the lack of the understanding and transparency. So it's, it's almost been um, uh, kind of a counter uh, incentive in that people have been conserving, they're using less water, and yet they see their water rates go up. And it's because it, it hasn't been clearly described that the rate increase is because of the deferred uh, aging infrastructure, the fixed rate cost, but to the average homeowner, that they don't understand that. So, Water agencies are going to have to do a better job at having continual communication with their customers on 
what part of their water bill is for the fixed cost, the delivery of the water there, and what is for the actual water use, the variable water use, month to month. I believe this lady from the postgraduate school here has had her hand up for a long time. I'm, I'm Mitzi Wertheim with, I'd actually like to look at you. Uh, I'm Mitzi Wertheim with the Naval Postgraduate School. Um, I've been dealing with energy since 04. It is an unbelievably complex topic, and it doesn't matter which, one, which door you use to get into this space. I actually like it because it's complex, but part of the challenge is exactly what you've been talking about, which is communication. So I, I deal with all my friends who are in academia, dealing with lower kids, and they say, if you don't write your story in a way that an 11-year-old <laughs> can understand it, you've lost your audience because you want the general community to get it. That's really hard. Cartoonists tend to be very good at doing that. Uh, journalists who have to write short pieces, I mean, I'm dealing with these kinds of folks in Washington as we try to figure out how to educate people. We don't do it in the schools. I mean, and, and I keep thinking about, wouldn't these be great problems. I mean, when I went to school, the math problems were you had trains coming from different directions. At what point were they going to crash? I think these are much more interesting problems to have kids working at. And, you know, kind of what happened when we wanted to change attitudes about smoking. We taught it in the schools, and they went home and hounded their parents. And I think maybe what you ought to do is involve journalist students, art students, and, and make it sort of a a crowd searching or a crowd collection activity where they all take part of the ownership of telling the story so the people you're trying to reach can actually get it. Uh, I totally agree. Um, and who's going to do that? Who's going to take the leadership and make that happen? The five of you? Well, I can only speak for myself and uh, Department of Water Resources. You remember that busy slide I put up with the 30 resource management strategies? One of the newest strategies we're just adding is outreach and education. So it's now been recognized as a very important part of doing water management. Uh, and uh, I, I think, uh, you know, the Water Education Foundation in California, I think, has done an admirable job of putting out pretty non-biased um, uh, water information. But I think it's up to every... Uh, you know, in California, we have a lot of fiefdoms in water. Uh, people, uh, we have 58 counties, several hundred cities, over 2,300 special districts that are responsible for managing some aspect of water, and historically, they haven't communicated well. And that's why the state is working with locals to create more regional collaboratives. And now we've got 48 regional water management groups who came together because the state put water um, uh, grant program and said called it integrated regional water management and so in the bay area you have a regional water man uh, two or three regional water management groups that can help there the other thing is they did a survey just recently and asked people where does your water come from and only 10 percent of the public knew i mean they it comes from the tap right so <laughs> we have time i believe for one more question and then they've Ask me to be the policeman, the folks with a higher pay grade than mine, because they say you have other interesting topics to get to this <laughs> afternoon and only five minutes to get there. So let's try one more question. wonder if we could take the uh, Silicon Valley part of the session title seriously for a minute. Um, what, what kind of, what would you say would be priorities for city governments uh, and, and industry actors in Silicon Valley? I mean, you've talked about a lot of different pieces, but where would, where would your priorities be? Well, I would say find your regional water, the closest regional water management group to you and get involved. And uh, that's where the state is really putting its marbles to try to uh, ad advance these collaborative regional water management groups. And that's where the state is putting its funding to try to uh, partner with locals. I think my issue is, my, my question is really quick. Which of the issues that you've identified Oh, would be I see. Here in Silicon Valley, uh, some of your local municipal uh, water companies 
are taking a very proactive approach with reclaimed water. Some of the others, uh, maybe not so much of a proactive approach yet. Anything you can do to encourage local water officials to take a hard look at, recirc uh, at recycle uh, water, I think would be very helpful. All of these facilities we see around us here have cooling systems. All of those cooling systems could be operated on recycled water rather than potable water. But I think just like every other part of the state, it's not going to be one size fits all type of thing. And you need to be pulling on five or ten levers at the same time because these, these efficiency improvements can have a huge impact uh, 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 in terms of, of the demand. Uh, so there's, it's just some parts of the state are uh, more important. We don't have the industry here in terms of the, those high loads and the agriculture here, so it has to be focused on the commercial and the, uh, uh, and the residential. And I also think that um, bond acts, state water bond acts, we've had many of those over the years. There's one scheduled for, uh, what is it, next year, November? 2014. November of 2014. Right now it has, I'm not sure the exact numbers, but I think it actually has more money in there for restoration of the delta than it does for, for um, uh, recycling, conservation, those kinds of things. I would like to see more, more money for local solutions rather than these large projects that ship water hundreds of miles. What the, really the future of California and the Silicon Valley is regional self-sufficiency of water, not bringing it hundreds of miles. And we have a hard break for another commercial sponsor right here, your next session. Thank you very much. And I believe most of our panel members will be here for the afternoon. <laughs>